everybody, it's Miss England 2003, Jackie Turner, and you're listening to Life After the Crown with Tim Teowdo. Hey everybody, welcome to the Life After the Crown podcast, where each episode I bring you interviews with former pageant contestants, title holders, and women of influence who are now succeeding across many different industries in the real world. My name is Tim Tialdo, TV and pageant host, entrepreneur, author, and somebody who just wants to help you become better. Now, if you're wondering what life looks like after pageants, the advice, the stories, and the interviews that you hear on this podcast will not only inspire you, but help make your transition from pageants to professional life a bit easier to handle. So if this is your first time listening, thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're with us. Let's get started. My guest today won the Miss England title back in November of 2003 in London. She then went on to join the rest of the worldwide winners in China for the Miss World competition, where she placed 17th out of 108 women. After winning Miss England, she started developing her hosting and presenting skills at various beauty contests and events throughout the UK, and is now a respected judge for the model and pageant world. She has mixed her modeling career with work as a health, beauty, and fitness trainer, which always remains a passion for her. All the while, her modeling commitments allowed her to work with numerous products and magazines like Oil of Olay, Herbal Essences, Bobby Brown Makeup, Sue Devitt Makeup, and QVC. She continues to model today in other fashion and beauty projects, as well as presenting and hosting. Her success and skill of spotting talent has given her a springboard into other media projects, including the management and development of artists, as well as TV work and movie productions. Jackie Turner, great to have you stop by the podcast. Welcome to Life After the Crown. Wow. Well, thank you, Tim. Thanks very much for having me. That all sounds rather incredible. Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> I didn't know I'd done so much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you apparently have. So let's talk about the, the media projects and the management. So you live in Nashville, Tennessee right now. Um, talk about all that you're doing there currently. Well, yes, I moved to Nashville. Um, and it was all, I, I'd been here for a couple of years anyway, on and off, and I decided to get my green card and come back um, with every intention to kind of move around and, and go to L.A. for a while and stay there and work there. Um, but I just seem to have found myself um, growing more and more in Nashville. I work on a number of projects. Um, the first project is a massive passion of mine, and that's to get behind the camera. So I've joined forces with a production company, and we have some TV shows. We've got some movies in the pipeline. We create little commercials for the local business, businesses around town. So that's something I absolutely love. We're trying to create TV shows with perhaps me uh, hosting with another co-host, who's a kind of a fashion icon around Nashville and hopefully we can get something like that going together. So that's one of the things I do in Nashville, which I absolutely love. And then the course is the music passion that I've always had. Um, and that's one of the reasons I originally came to Nashville. So I've come that up over the years and, and learned my, my skill and I tour manage and I'm currently co-managing an artist and kind of going down that route. I'm doing a few things here. And then, of course, if anything else comes my way, a few voiceovers here and there. But um, it's the production company and the music side that I'm doing in Nashville, and I absolutely love it. Yeah, where does that passion for the music really come from? Because it sounds like it's a big part of your life. Sure. Um, the music stems, I think, from I used to be in the choir. My twin sister and I would sing together, and I learned the flute. Um, my dad was always playing music and um, country music. And um, I think it's just something I've always turned to. I think a lot of people turn to things when they go through things in life and mine is music so um when I was I'd kind of finished with the modeling world for a little while and I, I wanted to get behind the scenes and behind the camera and try and help other people and that's I think around 2008 was when I was starting to find somebody to manage or to help um develop and I think it just kind of stems from there and when you're surrounded by the music and surrounded by people that play and they're such incredibly talented it just I don't know. It warms my heart. It just gives me a big smile. It's hard to explain. It's my, the music is my is my release, is my getaway. So, and working with people, seeing their talents, and helping them get seen and get out there. I think I was once uh, talking about this quite a few years ago. I I was holding pageants um, in Dorset for a while and, and doing some hosting and some judging for them. And uh, I at the time I was looking for the first person to manage. And they were like, why are you trying to do this? And I, was, I, I just said, I feel like there's so, there's so many talented people out there. And it's so hard to get into the industry. And it's so hard to be heard and to even be taken seriously, especially in the music industry. 
I just want to help people. I want to, because I keep hearing these amazing tunes and these amazing voices. I want them to be heard. And that's where the passion stemmed from. And I thought, right, I need to kind of go with this and I need to see where I can take it. So that's, that's where I basically started. You had mentioned to me in a previous conversation, and let's go back to your pageant career. Um, you originally, yeah. you were not a pageant girl. This is not something you wanted to do. Your mom got you involved in it by entering you into a pageant. Can you talk about the story? Yes, I had, I was uh, a, a typical model and doing um, sort of runway and com- well, mainly commercial, a tiny bit of runway, um, a little bit of editorial. And so in that world, pageantry isn't something that people would consider. And a lot of the commercial models and, and some of my agents would say, I mean, this is after I won. They were like, you know, don't say you've been a pageant person because, you know, people don't take you seriously as a model if you're a pageant winner or whatever. So anyway, so I, before I'd even been entered, I had this kind of image of what pageantry was like. And you just see in the olden days, you know, these, these women just kind of being paraded in their swimwear and it's very male dominated. By, and I just thought, I just, I, it's not something I want to do. Um, but my mum saw this ad in the paper and it was just, you know, looking for girls and she entered me and she didn't say anything to me until I'd got through to the, to the final stages or whatever it was. And so she surprised me with this news and I was like, I'm not doing it. No, no, that's not for me. It's, I'm not a pageant person. Um, they're all girly girlies. I don't really get on with girls. I used to get bullied at school by girls. They wanted to cut my hair and slash my face. So I just didn't want to be thrown into a situation where I was surrounded by women um, who could potentially be nasty um, and have to dress up all girly girly because I'm kind of a bit more of a tomboy. So um, eventually, with my mum and the persuasion of the organiser, I decided to do it because I thought, all right, well, what have I got to lose? I can go. If I hate it, it's just two days of my life, um, you know, and I can come home and I can forget about it. So I trotted off to London um, and we had like a two day, like a weekend prep. And then it was the final show, the Miss England competition. And the girls were great and they were lovely. And I made some really nice friends. None of them were what I imagined them to be. There was no girly girls, I suppose. Everybody was very down to earth and professional. Some of them were in education. Some of them were heading off to be a lawyers. And, and you think, ah, all right. I've been completely um, misguided here. Did you just think that they're, I don't know, and I feel terrible for saying this um, because I know it's not true, but you just assume they're just people that don't want to do anything else other than look pretty. So um, so I had a great weekend. Um, we did a show. There was no parading around in, in swimwear. There was like a sports round. Um, and at the time, I was training to be a personal trainer because I've always liked sport and nutrition. So um, my talent was... Um, getting everybody in the audience up on their feet. And I did a workout with them, which was very funny. Got all the judges up and, and I had a really nice time. And uh, when they said, you know, they called my name as the winner, I was just totally dumbfounded. I, I could not believe it. <laughs> I just assumed I was, I just assumed I was there just to have fun with the girls and just to take part, you know, and just have a really good weekend. And it was actually a really good experience to know that at that point, in my life that women were nice because up until then I hadn't had a really good experience with women and um, you know people can be very nasty and 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 that's another reason why I wanted to kind of follow this on and really make a point of when I did pageants myself and when I hosted the pageant we made a point of saying women should stand together they shouldn't be against each other um, and so it was a really good turning point for me and I'm really glad I did it. Well, you talked about it, and I would like to kind of hit on it if I could a little bit. Uh, I read an article in the Daily Mail, and the headline says, Girls at school threatened to slash my face and cut my hair off because I was a model. Former Miss England wants to help other beauty queens beat the bullies. Uh, tell me the story. Yeah. I mean, I, let's let's go back to, you know, th- those days and what was happening and, you know, where it all stems from and how you've kind of translated it into helping others. It, we were all at school and we we're all just, you know, I think I'd moved up from the, the kind of school that you go to, like the primary bit. And then you go up to the secondary school and you're slightly a bit older and you're kind of growing and becoming women. Um, and it was at that point that um, I started getting bullied. And it was like small comments to begin with. And it was just, you know, kind of brushing past you in the, in the corridor and like kind of pushing you a little bit. And then it got to the point where 
it kind of stemmed to the I uh, wanting to slash a face and getting off the school bus. And then when you get off the school bus, you have to make sure you've got your friends with you because if they get you on your own, they could do all sorts of things. And they were like supposedly carrying scissors on the on the school bus so they could come and cut my hair. And it was it was just stemming way, way out of control. And the whole school got involved. The teachers got involved. Um, there was people were making up rumors left, right and center. And I was just like, I have no idea why this is happening. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't spoken to anybody, but they just took it upon themselves to think that I was, a, you know what, if people, if somebody is pretty and this happens worldwide and it still happens today, people make assumptions about you. And so, and that's what happened to me. You know, even I think the girls at the time just had no idea who I was and they were just, she's pretty, she's got long hair. She's been in the paper because she won a competition. You know, we have to slash her face. We have to make her life hell because, you know, she can't be a nice person. She's, I don't know. I don't know what they thought. And I, I even, I'd love to chat to them one day and say, why did you behave that way? But, um, and it just got so out of hand uh, that we had this huge thing. I think I remember the school all lining up against the fence, like all the years, and the teachers were out there and it was all going to happen. And then it just, it just stopped. I think, and I think the teachers got involved with the girls and some people got expelled or suspended. I'm not really sure. But I was just completely blown away by the behavior of of people that it made me be really aware that people go through all sorts of things in their life and just because they're not the same as you or they might have something that looks better than you or they've got a career, you know, you can't be envious. And you certainly can't bully people. I mean, what, what is that going to get you? So when I was hosting the Miss Dorsets and doing the pageants, I really wanted to make it aware that the girls, you can do anything. And if you are, if you are getting bullied, don't let that stop you. And I remember when I hosted the Miss Dorset, we ran one in Bournemouth. And I got, I think I got somebody to come in and said, look, you know, she is here to talk to you all. Because I know why you're all doing this. You're doing this because you all feel a bit lost. You're trying to find something to do. That was what they all said. We don't know what we want in life. I lack confidence. You know, I, I was bullied at school a little bit. I don't know where I'm going. So I encouraged them and I got some uh, people to come in and talk to the girls about, you know, you are unique. You are you. There's a reason you are here. And let's bring out the best in you. And it's great to be a woman and support each other. Um, and I, and I, even today, um, when I see people being mean to people, um, I kind of say, you know, I, why are you doing that? What's the point? Where did, what, you know, what is it doing for you and what is it doing for them? Absolutely nothing. And uh, you're not going to get anything from this. And, I, and, I, and to this day, I still do it. And I even, you know, if anybody's even joking about somebody, I don't like it. I get very funny about it. Well, do you have a way that you, I guess, recommend that people deal with it? Because, you know, back when you were bullied, it was more physical bullying, literally like face-to-face yeah. intimidation. Whereas now with social media, since it, is it evolved over the last couple of decades here, um, it's more, you know, I'm si- I'm sitting on a computer and I can make fun of you or I can, you know, demean you and you can't do anything to me because you either don't know who I am or you can't touch me. And so it's a little right. bit different form of either social or psychological uh, bullying. Yeah. Um, do you talk to girls about that today? I Yes. And I, and I, even my nieces, I, I sometimes talk to because they go through the same thing. Like this, this new generation, that's all they have to deal with. You know, they can't just leave the school and leave the bullying behind. It follows them home. And it's there when they wake up because of all the social media. And the only thing you can do, and I and I really do encourage this, is to put the phone down. These people don't know you. <clears throat> They're making judgments. They're obviously going through bad stuff themselves. And we shouldn't take what they say to heart. And it is very difficult, especially when you're young and you're going through hormones and you can't really work out, you know, what to believe or what not to believe. But I would, I think social media, as much as it's good to push people in the right direction for certain things, it's um, it's a very negative thing, and I think people just need to put the phone down, block people. You know, don't listen to the tweets, don't read all the messages. You know, and, and talk to people. If you're, I say to my nieces, if you're going through situations, these people are obviously hurting in some way, and the way that they're dealing with it is by being mean to you. And so, how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, I try and treat people with kindness. So, if somebody gives me bad wording give something nice back and it actually makes uh, you feel good and the other person feel good if you can retaliate in a way that's a kind way. 
Um, and secondly, if the person is still coming at you and still bombarding your text messages or all these social medias, you have to block them. Don't take what they're saying to heart. Maybe this person needs help in some way. I don't know. But I believe people are vicious and nasty because they've got stuff going on. So I would encourage, and I'm using my niece as an example because I feel like that's the generation that are getting this kind of things now. Um, you know, retaliate in kindness, push back with kindness. It's actually quite, it's, it's not, connected to pageantry but I was seeing a friend yesterday and he was just like I I'm so fed up with everybody being strangers and not people being nice to each other and he goes I've made these pins and the pin says your friend and he said I'm going to give you some and, and wherever you go and can you please forward it on to other people if you see somebody that you think they think needs a smile or needs some help give them a little pin and say we're your friend and Strangers should become friends. And I think if we can all treat each other, each other with kindness, maybe the bullying will stop. Maybe the bullies will think, actually, why am I doing this? I, they're actually not very bad. They're, they're actually a good person. And what I'm doing is really not helping anybody. So you just have to keep on and keep trying and, and try and, I don't know, dissolve the, dissolve the people that are being nasty with kindness. Let me ask you this. Did getting into pageants and eventually winning help you to overcome the effects of the bullying or even almost, I wouldn't call it a form of vengeance because it wasn't an evil thing, but it was like, hey, I am pretty and I'm celebrating that. I've never been, I'm a, I'm a tomboy, really. And um, I, even when I won, um, I never considered myself um, better or prettier than anybody else. Um, and, and maybe I should have been a bit more cocky growing up because I, I've always suffered with the lack of confidence. And then I think, you know, sometimes when you are thrown into an industry that's all about looks and, you know, you've got to try and prove yourself uh, that you have a brain and that kind of thing. I always, I, I never felt like I was better than anybody. And I, I, and I still try to this day to prove myself in other ways because I just don't want to be seen as somebody that came up and just looks pretty. You know, and there have been people I've dated over the years who just want something pretty on their arm. So I don't think I ever felt that way. In fact, I didn't even think of the bullies when I won. I just I just thought, wow, this is a really awesome thing and I can't believe I've won. And now I need to go and find a load of dresses for Miss World. Like, I, I, it didn't even occur to me to even think of the bullies, to be, to be honest. I just think that women can, when we're all born the way that we're born. We're all made the way we're made. I can't help the way I look, but I can certainly strive to do the best and show kindness wherever I go. Um, and I do really love um, the business side of things and being behind the camera and behind the scenes and pushing other people. Well, I appreciate the humility in that answer. So let's <laughs> talk about the good side of what happened from the pageant. Now, uh, I was reading how the title of Miss England really helped you to make uh, some significant contacts. You know, on one occasion, you were invited to Buckingham Palace to meet Prince Philip's. Uh, after raising yeah. a, a, apparently a, a significant amount of money for a special boat service. Can you talk about how that unfolded? Oh, yes, that was wonderful. We had been doing, a, a few of us had been doing some, some stuff for charity. And um, over the years, we've kind of been, you know, raising money here, there and everywhere. And then the final, at the end of the year, they have a big dinner. Um, and so at this big dinner, you know, I invited a few people down and it's, and over the years you kind of meet people and you meet, um, people that, uh, invest in certain things or, you know, you just meet people as you go. And so we had this wonderful table full of people who were all bidding on these auctions and all bidding on these, um, prizes and things. And we managed to raise quite a lot of money, actually shockingly quite a lot of money. And then the following year we did it again, um, and raised even more money. And so, and just as a thank you to some of the people that were raising so much money, we got invited to the palace. Um, and there was quite a few of us there. There's lots of people that do what I do. So it's not just me doing this wonderful thing. There was, I, I can't remember how many it was. It's probably around 30 people. And they all got invited to the palace just to say a big thank you for raising money for this boat service. Um, and a lot of the people there were in the, the Marines or the Army and the boat service. So... It was just giving something back. They worked so hard for us. So it, was just, it just felt great that we could give something back. So that was super exciting. Yeah, my mum has a picture of me with Prince um, <laughs> Philip in her lounge. <laughs> it's one that will always remain on the wall, I'm sure. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, the crown obviously led you into modeling. Uh, then you kind of get tied up with some TV programs, and you learn that you're actually pretty good at on camera with being a host and a presenter uh, at what point did you say, this is actually something I'd like to do with my career? I love it. I, after I won Miss England, um, one of the things they get you to do is, is they want you to host 
um, like a pageant. So whilst I was the reigning Miss England, I would then go and host a few pageants. And I was super nervous to begin with because they give you a script and, you, and at the time you think, I've got to follow the script. I've got to say exactly what the script says. And then it didn't take me too long to, to work out that, well, as long as I know the gist, you know, ad-libbing and, and just talking freely is much more personal and, and it just flows a lot better. So once I finished the year, we started doing a few more projects um, where I would host a few things. And I was like, I have got this. Maybe this is my calling. This is what I love to do. Because it's not just sitting in front of the camera and having a photo taken for a modeling job. It's actually talking. I can get my personality across. Um, and I can, I can actually talk to people. So it just kind of sped on from there. And I absolutely love it. And as soon as the, it, it's funny, I, I try and push other people these days, but as soon as the camera gets in front of me um, and I get the microphone or whatever it is, I, I start flying and, and I really go with it. Um, when I was in Nashville um, to sped forward a, a, quite a few years of, of doing this, um, we got to work on a little TV show with, this, with Jonathan Kane, who's a fashion designer. And he and I were co-hosts. And the footage is incredible. Um, I absolutely loved it. And I think it's definitely one of my happy places to know that I can be in front of the camera and just talk and be fun and, and be funny and, um, you know, just show my show the personality of, of me. But at the same time, I like to talk to people and get to know them. So when I interview people, I thrive because I get to, I want them to shine. So And, and that's my favorite thing to do. And so, you know, I'm, Always looking for projects to be in front of the camera. <laughs> what would be uh, what would be a, like one of your favorite types of project that you would get to do? What type of show would be your dream job, so to speak? Oh, uh, we've been so I've, I've been kind of thinking of so many shows, and there's lots of things that I'd love to do. One of them would be I love cooking. I'm trying to create some cookbooks right now. It's been a couple of years in the process, but I love cooking. So and I love music. So my dream job will probably be either on location or um, in a studio somewhere, maybe the mixture of both. And it would be uh, surrounded by maybe getting artists in to talk about their music and, and, or people that are doing things that are benefiting the world and cooking with them. And then maybe go on location or travel around the world and find amazing food and amazing people and combining it together and, and just finding out what they're doing. I want to know what people are doing in the world. And I want to find out what they eat. And I want to try and encourage people to eat well if they're not eating well. So something along those lines would be my dream. Speaking of eating well, um, you, you work a lot yeah. as a health, beauty, and fitness trainer. Uh, that remains one of the big passions in your life. Talk about you know, how you do that in, with your career. Because when you travel a lot, it is tough to stay in shape and eat well. And how do you kind of go about doing that? Funny enough, I was actually talking to a friend of mine in the music world. And I was like, I'm going to create something for people that travel that encourages them to eat well and work out on the road because it is super hard. And I recently was tour managing with my boyfriend through Europe and you find that you, you can't get to a gym, you can't eat in certain foods, you can't be fussy, you just got to eat what you can. So um, my way of dealing with that is I take stuff with me on the road so I can work out anywhere in a hotel room. I'm also, because I do personal training, so there's nothing I can't work out or do without weights or without a gym you can do anything at home there's no there's no limit to what you can do with body weight and things like that and then food wise because i love to cook and i trained as a nutrition to a nutritionist sorry i we will go to a grocery store or we will find um, places that we can buy food and we majority of the time cook stuff for ourselves or there's actually a very good menus are great these days like most restaurants will have healthy foods in the restaurants. You just gotta be able to choose wisely and choose carefully. So um yeah, I'm I'm thinking of trying to create something for people. It's pretty easy really if you think about it. You just make sure you get your heart pumping for fifteen minutes a day at least. Um, and you, you choose wisely with your food and don't eat too late. Now, when it comes to modeling, uh, we mentioned some of the brands that you've worked with, Oil of Olay, Herbal Essences, Bobby Brown Makeup, uh, QVC. Are those things that you still do to this day or want to do, or has the music business really taken over in your career? I, I think I would prefer to do what I'm doing now. I used to love, I love modeling and I think it's great, and I'll never turn down a job if it comes my way, but um, I do really enjoy um, either talking in front of the camera, so maybe I could talk about herbal essence. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> but um, but I do love. I do get very excited when I'm working on music projects and I'm encouraging people and helping people and tour managing and 
I, I advanced my first tour recently. I'd never advanced a tour before because I'd I've always been like a day to day manager, and I absolutely loved it. So I think I think I'm on the right path. Whatever the, wherever it's leading me, I'm unsure. But right currently, right now, I'm I'm really in a very happy place, and I'm loving what I'm doing. But you know, never say never. You were an ambassador for uh, what's called Formula E, which was uh, the world's first fully electric racing series. Uh, what was that experience yeah. like? Because it's kind of like Formula One, yes. It is. It's very like Formula One. Um, in fact, some of the creators of it work or have teams with Formula One or have come from Formula One. Um, it was um, a concept that was created, um, I think, within like a two or three year uh, idea from being on a napkin to being reality. And it's about um, a Formula One car, very similar, um, slightly smaller in size and with a fully electric battery that the car runs from. And it was incredible. I did it for a couple of seasons. Um, it's a pretty insane lifestyle. And we used to go off, I think our first ever race was in um, Beijing. And we traveled all around the world. And it was in the early stages. So we had to kind of sell it to people that were big petrol heads. So we'd have our first race. And we'd take all these people down to the pits and walk them around and to the garages. And they'd be like, well, where's the noise? And we would explain, <laughs> well, that's the whole point. You can go to these races, there's no noise pollution, and you can get kind of the same thrill as you get with a Formula One, except you don't have to wear these big, huge headphones and, you know, and, and you can't talk. And it, a, a Formula One is fun, but um, I guess for somebody like me, I, I went to a few and I was just like, I can't speak. I, you know, I'd much rather just sit and watch something that you can actually have a conversation with somebody as well. <laughs> so um, there was a few people that didn't get it. They were like, no, it has to be noise, like the petrol head guys. But then a lot of people did get it, and it's incredible. It's doing really well now. I think it's in its third or I think the fourth year now, and they're growing and they're getting stronger and stronger, and they're going to more destinations. But it was a it was a great experience. The parties were amazing afterwards. But it's hard work. You have um, you're I think you're traveling for, I think it's a Thursday. You get there, and then the Thursday and Friday you're setting up. The, the Saturday and the Sunday are the races. And then you kind of pack down and you leave. So it was exhausting. And I think after the first year, I, was, I felt myself thinking, this is for the younger generation. I think I'm ready to, you know, hang up my Formula E trainers and, and let someone else take it on because it's, it's a massive slog. But it was a, it's an amazing experience. And I, and I hope they continue to do really well. Yeah, it sounds like it was really cool. Um, I want to dive real quick yeah. back into your pageant uh, days. Um, now living in America. So you live in Nashville. You come from England. You competed in pageants over there, competed in Miss World as Miss England. Do you see a big difference between pageants in England and pageants in America? Absolutely, totally. Well, first of all, pageants in America are huge and people love them and respect them. And if you say to anybody in America, uh, oh, I was in Miss England, they're like, oh, wow, that's incredible. And in England, People aren't that fussed about it, to be honest. The people in the pageant world are, but every, you know, the normal Joe on the street, they're like, pageant? What? Oh, Miss England? Oh, okay. They're, it's not something that they, they even think about. And the girls, is, there's, there's, a, there's an air of glamour and glitz and like whoever wins the pageants in America, they go on to do like these fabulous, wonderful things. And, um, and I don't feel that England has tapped into that or even if they have I think everybody's a little bit more modest <laughs> a little bit more shy about what they're doing and they tend to I don't know not follow the same footsteps I noticed um the bachelor I, I was flicking the tv the other night and I and it came on and is it um there's an ex there's an ex miss Kentucky or something she's new, the now new bachelorette um and oh it's, Hannah Brown it's, yep. yeah that's yep. right and she's wonderful and she's cute and she's lovely and she's very glamorous and uh, and that's the kind of stuff that happens here. Like I think in England, the ex misses when they finish their reign and, and they go off, they, they go back to being a lawyer or they're, you know, they might, some of them might go on and do a bit of acting, but it, 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 it's definitely a different feel. Um, and I certainly don't think that the English public appreciate or really care about pageantry as much as the American public, for sure. Okay. Well, really interesting to hear. Uh, one more thing yeah. I want to talk about, if we could. I know you have a huge passion for giving back. You've been given a lot in your life through what you've accomplished. And uh, if you could talk about some of the charities and events that you work with. There's one charity which is really close to my heart, and it's with the YMCA. 
Um, it's a little bit different to the one in America. In, 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 uh, well, I'm actually not quite sure if the American is the same, but in England, um, we do, um, it's the YMCA, and it, they run like special needs play schemes throughout all of Dorset and the county council and things. And so that's a massive charity of ours that we raise money for. And because these children, they go to school, some of them, and then some of them can't be schooled. And of course, the parents, they have to, you know, have their full time jobs and then they have to come home and look after their children. So we try and create these organizations that take the kids um, at least for the day or at least between the working hours of the parents and, you know, give them fun times. And we do painting and you know kayaking, and whatever we can do. Um, that's one of the things we do. Uh, and my sister, Shelley, she, she's kind of the boss of that. Um, and then another thing we raise money for is uh, a company called Julia's House. And it's a hospice for terminally ill children. And it was very close to my sister's heart. One of my sisters passed away from ovarian cancer. And she was very part of Julia's House. And it meant so much to her. Um, and at the time, we were all kind of, we were all involved. We would do, our, my family is a very close family. So whatever we do, we, we do together. So if there's a big event coming up, everybody's roped in to help. And so uh, the Sarah was part of Julia's house. So um, once she passed away, we, we then kind of wrapped it up and started doing a lot more for Julia's house and the, the children and the hospice. And I jumped out of a plane, which I never thought I would do. But <laughs> one of the things I wanted to do to raise money for Julia's house um, to say thank you for my sister and, and for all that they do with the children. And I jumped out of the plane and it was the most incredible thing I ever did. And I remember being up in the plane and the guy, I was strapped, he was strapped to my back and he kind of tapped me on the shoulder and goes, are you okay? Because I was super quiet. And I was like, yep, I just feel really peaceful and whatever happens, happens. And it, it's the most bizarre feeling in the world. I wasn't nervous in the slightest and I just fell out of the plane and just, it was threefold for, I think it's like a second and a half and then the parachute goes open and it was just incredible. And I'm so glad I did it and I'll do it again. But um, yeah, those are, those are mainly the two charities that we, we try and raise money for. And then anything else, heart disease is another thing. My dad died of heart disease. So any chance we get to raise money and to bring awareness, we try and do. But I thoroughly recommend anybody jumping out of a plane. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> awesome that you do those things and I'm sure... No yeah. doubt that jumping out of a plane was great. I've never done it, and I, I certainly want to here in the future. So thanks for sharing yeah. that. All right, okay. so now it's time for what uh, what's called the rapid-fire get-to-know-you questions. Again, it's kind of like a game show. It's supposed to be fun, so these are not serious questions, so have fun with them. Are you okay. ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. Number one, what type of milk do you put in your cereal if you eat it? Ooh, I make my own, and I make um, – it's always organic, and it's oat or almonds, any kind of nuts or oats, and I make my own milk. Oh, so you make it in a blender? Yes, I blend up whatever I fancy. So it could be some oats, nuts, pecans, almonds, whatever, and I'll throw it in a blender with some water and blend it up, squeeze it through my cloth, and there you are, I've got milk. Very easy to make. you you are all in on the serious healthy stuff there. Oh, totally, but the thing is you never run out of milk because as long as you've got some nuts in the fridge, you've always got milk. All right. Very good. Number two, did you ever <laughs> believe in Santa Claus? Oh, I did. I did believe in Santa Claus until um, I think I was about six or seven, and my brother woke me up by bringing the stack of presents up to the end of our bed. And I remember kind of opening my eyes and going, Oh, I thought Santa. And see, my brother Stephen, he was like, No, it's just me. And that was it. So I, I stopped believing it. About <laughs> he kind of <feeling. laughs> ruined it for you at that point, yeah. Yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> Number three, are dogs people to you? Oh, I love dogs. I'm a huge animal person. And um, I currently live um, in Nashville with a housemate, and she has a big dog. And I talk to it and cuddle it and chat to it and all sorts. So, yes, they are human, they are adorable. Number four, what's the most number of hours that you've watched TV in a single day? Oh, in a single day, probably around about five. I oh, well, that's sometimes not that bad. I, No, I guess it's not. I mean, sometimes I, I, it's quite naughty, really, but sometimes I'll just come in the house and switch it on so it's always on, just so I've got <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of noise in the background so I don't okay. feel like I'm completely alone. <laughs> Number five, and you had talked a little bit about food earlier. Do you Instagram your food? 
Yes, um, I do. And um, I used to do it on my personal page, but now I have a proper page so I don't bombard all my friends with my food. So I have a delicious Jackie page on Instagram and that's for all my food. Yes. So that's what it is, at Delicious Jackie? Deliciously Jackie uh, uh, on Instagram and on Facebook and I post nothing but food. <laughs> very good. All right, number six. Do you have any friends taller than six foot four inches tall? Um, yes, I have my friend Ian. He's six foot five. He lives in Oxford, England. And he's a super tall person. Very, very okay. tall. Number seven. If there's a spider in your house, do you kill it or do you set it free? Well... Um, it's a mix of two. When I was living in England, we would kill. We would actually hoover them up. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But we would get <laughs> spout from spout from the hoover and hoover them because we were super scared of spiders. But since being in America, and my boyfriend is super, he loves nature. I'm. I tend to be a bit more kinder. Unless it's a brown recluse, then I try and get it outside and get it away safely. Okay, so you're saving unless it's a brown recluse. So that's fair. Yeah. Number eight. <laughs> Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? Oh, totally. What's animal crackers? What are they? You've never had animal crackers? <laughs> oh, no. man. Oh, well, ask your boyfriend <laughs> Ask your boyfriend to go to the store and get you some animal crackers just so you can experience them. Are they organic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> technically, no, I mean, maybe not. the label might say that, but no, they're not. <laughs> they're like glorified cookies, basically. Oh, well, I guess there's, I mean, I think, well, because I don't know where they are, I guess there's no animal fat in them. I guess they're vegetarian. And, and if you them. find organic animal crackers, let me know. I'd certainly love to try them. Totally, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, scale of one to ten, how good are you at keeping secrets? Oh, I'm very good. I'm very good. No, I think I'm a ten. I can okay. keep a secret. Very good. I like that. Number ten, last one. Who was your first celebrity crush? Oh, it was Matt Dillon. And I always had a crush on him since that movie. Well, I read the book first, The Outsiders. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, and I thought it was fascinating because I was super young and I shouldn't be reading it. And then I saw the movie. And then cut, fast forward a few years, I met him in New York. Um, I was with a friend of mine at the time and we ended up having dinner and we joined his table and we took photos. So I met my crush, Matt Dillon. Wow, how about that? Well, congratulations yeah. on that. So you are off the hook. That's 10 questions. Thanks for answering those. Way to go. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. It's fun. Very fun. Yeah, so uh, real quick before we go here, tell us where you're kind of going with your career at this point. I know you've got a, a boyfriend who lives in another state and you're kind of splitting time. You're doing tour managing. So what would you like to ultimately see your career do at this point? I would love, I mean, I, I want to help pursue his career because I'm tour managing him. So that's something that's very important to me. And then the other side of things is we want to try and create some TV shows where we get funded, you know, we get the investment, we go off, we make the TV shows, um, and then I can divide my time between the two places. So that would be heaven to me. And if I could create a show with, with Jonathan or somebody else as a host, that's uh, an extra bonus. All right. Well, best of luck to you. Thanks for taking the time today. Really appreciate you coming on. You are awesome, Jackie Turner. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. It's been really, really nice. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode and to Jackie Turner for her time. If you want to learn more about Jackie, you can follow her on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all the same handle, at Jacqueline Turner. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you wouldn't mind, please subscribe. You can do so on Spotify, iTunes, the podcast app, Google Play, YouTube, or just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram at Tim Tialdo. Until next time, remember the words of Proverbs 17.17. 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Believe in yourself, have faith, and pursue your dreams with no fear, ladies. Have a great week. Have a great week.